Is the Trinity Biblical? Welcome to the Biblically Correct Podcast. Shalom, y'all. This is the Biblically Correct Podcast, teaching biblical correctness in a biblically incorrect world. My name is Kevin Jeffrey. I am a Jewish follower of the Messiah Yeshua, Jesus, and I love teaching the scriptures. The Trinity is arguably the foundational doctrine of historical Christianity. The teaching of a triune Godhead, of one God in three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is at the center of the Christian creeds and is universally accepted across denominational lines. Even Messianic Judaism, employing the supposedly more Jewish-friendly term triunity, embraces this ancient doctrine. But is it true that the God of Israel, whom Moses says is one, is actually also three? Can the doctrine of the Trinity really be found in the Bible, and is holding to a Trinitarian belief truly necessary for biblical faith? Today I want to look at the scriptures to determine whether they actually teach or even infer that God is a Trinity. Now, before you burn me at the stake, I'll begin first by affirming the core truth of what the Bible says about the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that I do in fact believe these to be true. But then I'll explain how this biblical teaching differs from the Trinity, and how Trinitarian philosophy wrongly and unnecessarily exceeds Scripture, how it creates obstacles for understanding and accepting the mysterious nature of God according to the Bible. My goal today isn't to deal with the history of Trinitarian doctrine or to exhaustively interact with the many explanations and defenses of it, but just to simply look at what Scripture does and doesn't say to see whether the Trinity is an accurate and biblical description of God. Now, as I already indicated, the Bible does teach the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father, of course, being the most obvious of the three. For example, in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Paul says, Yet to us there is one God, the Father. And he repeats this concept throughout his writings. Yeshua also repeatedly called God Father. And yet, this language isn't novel to the New Testament, as we see it also in Psalm 89, 26. You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. That Yeshua, who is the Son of God, is also God, is a little less clear, but still evident. We see this taught in verses such as John 1, 1, which says that in the beginning was the Word, the Word who, in Yeshua, later became flesh, according to verse 14, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yeshua even later says in chapter 10, verse 30, I and the Father are one. Also in Philippians 2.11, Paul declares most astonishingly that Yeshua the Messiah is Adonai, or the Lord, meaning God. And most clearly, in Colossians 2.9, Paul also says of Yeshua, in him all the fullness of the deity dwells bodily. I taught extensively about the deity and humanity of Yeshua back in episodes 13 and 14 if you want to check those out. But it should suffice to say that Scripture does teach that Yeshua is, in fact, God in the flesh. As for the Holy Spirit being God, and not just a force or agent sent from God, that one's actually even more difficult to demonstrate from the Scriptures than Yeshua's deity. I think the clearest passage on this is Acts chapter 5, where Peter equates the Holy Spirit with God. When Ananias lied to Peter about the sale and proceeds of his possessions, Peter says to him in verse 3, Why did Hasatan fill your heart for you to lie to the Ruach HaKodesh, to the Holy Spirit? And in verse 4 he continued, You did not lie to men, but to God. So Peter's drawing a parallel between the Holy Spirit and God. And finally, in the Hebrew Scriptures, we also see a similar parallelism in Job 33, 4, where Elihu says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So from just these few examples, 
we see that the Bible not only affirms, but teaches that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all God. And the fact that these three share a certain kind of commonality and oneness, which we find reflections of in passages such as the accounts of Yeshua's immersion or the closing verse of 2 Corinthians, this unity is probably most evident from Yeshua's own words in Matthew 28, 19, where he instructs his disciples, having gone then, disciple all the world ethnicities, immersing them to the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So if the Bible teaches that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are each and together God, and I believe what the Bible says, then why don't I accept the doctrine of the Trinity? How can I accept the deity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yet reject the Trinity? Aren't these the same thing? Isn't it just six of one, half a dozen of the other? No, it's not. Because the Trinity doctrine isn't just about whether the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are God, which the Bible definitely teaches, but whether God is a triune Godhead consisting of and limited to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These two concepts are not equivalent. And while the Bible has clear, abundant evidence of the former, that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are God, the Bible never uses the word Trinity, it never refers to the members of the Trinity as persons, it never explicitly indicates that God is triune, unless you accept the part of 1 John 5, 7 that was added in the King James Version, nor does Scripture imply that God is confined to this three-way box, unless, of course, you're already predisposed to that belief. Trinitarian doctrine is an invention of man's intellectual reasoning that tries to make sense of the breadth of God's incomprehensible deity, yet in its search for order and understanding, ends up overstepping its bounds. Let me explain. One of the first seeds which supposedly indicates that God is a trinity is said to be found in the Hebrew name of God himself, specifically the name Elohim. Whenever you see the word God in the Old Testament, so-called, it's translating this Hebrew word. And while God in English is a singular term referring to a single God, the word Elohim in Hebrew is a plural form, more than one. In fact, it's the same word used in Psalm 82.6, which Yeshua himself quoted, that says, you are gods. So Elohim is a plural word that the scriptures use hundreds of times to refer to the one and only God. So if you're filtering the word Elohim through a Trinitarian lens, this makes perfect sense and appears to be initial evidence for the Trinity. But there are a couple of things we need to consider. First, let's say for sake of argument that this plural word form is in fact indicating something to us about the nature of God. What this would be evidence for then is not specifically a trinity, but merely a plurality. The word Elohim itself would only indicate a number that's more than one. It could be two. It could be three. It could be more. Second, looking at it from a purely linguistic standpoint, the plural word Elohim is what's called an honorific plural, or a plural of majesty. It's used in Hebrew to refer to a singular object when the intention is to emphasize that thing's intensity or majesty. This same plural form is also found in the word behemoth, behemot, which is apparently a huge animal believed to have been a hippo or a dinosaur. Behemot is the plural form of behema, which is the Hebrew word for cattle or animal. So even though the word Elohim has a plural form, it's still describing a single thing. It emphasizes quality, not quantity. Linguistically speaking then, as my son Isaac puts it, the word Elohim isn't plural because God is plural. It's plural because God is great. So while it's unlikely that the word Elohim provides us any insight into the nature of God, even if it did, it wouldn't be that he is specifically a trinity, but a plurality, 
more than one. Another early indicator that's said to hint at God being a trinity is found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, where God is recorded as saying, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So as with Elohim, God here is speaking in the plural. Let us make man in our image. But who is God talking to? It's a reasonable question. And again, through a Trinitarian filter, the answer is obvious. He's speaking to the Word, who was with God in the beginning. Or he's speaking to the Spirit, who was hovering above the waters in verse 2. Or maybe he was speaking to both. But the fact of the matter is, the text doesn't say who God was talking to, why he was talking, or why he was referring to us. Because while he's speaking in the plural in verse 26, the narrative switches right back to the singular in verse 27, saying, And God created the man in his image. In the image of God, he had created him. It doesn't say in the image of God, they created him. The point is, it's extremely unclear why God here refers to us. And while we could speculate about it all day long, it could just be another linguistic phenomenon, similar to what we saw with Elohim. Nobody can say for sure. So while this plural language could be part of the puzzle to the nature of God, it still doesn't point directly to or limit God to a trinity. But the problems with the doctrine of the trinity extend far beyond infusing too much meaning into plural word forms. It creates problems of practical application when it comes to understanding both the Bible and the nature of God. Now, there are at least two major problems that the Trinity doctrine creates. And the first one is that it forces various not easily categorized manifestations of God into the categories of either the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. Take, for example, the pillars of cloud and fire that led the people of Israel in the desert after they'd been released from Egypt. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 21, it says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. So God is leading the people of Israel through the desert, both by day and night. And he's doing it in or as either a pillar of cloud or fire. So which person of the Trinity is it that's leading them? Is it the Father? Why would it be the Father? Based on what in the text? Maybe it's the Holy Spirit. The Spirit seems kind of non-corporeal. And there's fire, so maybe that fits. But again, does it say that in the text? Could it be the Son? Doesn't really seem like the Son, does it? Why not? Why would you not think that the cloud or fire are the Son? Or maybe you do. I mean, it's a visible image of the invisible God, right? Or maybe it's all three persons of the Trinity together at once. That would certainly be a convenient way of dealing with the passage. If you can't fit God in only one part of the box, just remove the partitions. So which person of the Trinity was leading the people of Israel? How about the account of the burning bush in Exodus 3? Here we find Moses out tending the flocks on the mountain of God. And it says in verse 2 that the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Then in verse 4 it says, When the Lord saw that Moses turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. So here we have the angel of the Lord appearing to Moses in the flame of the burning bush. But then it says that it's God, Adonai, who sees Moses and speaks to him. So are the angel of the Lord and God the same thing? Is the angel of the Lord distinct from God himself, even though it's God speaking when the angel speaks? It seems like they're the same thing, right? But more importantly, which person of the Trinity is supposedly appearing and speaking here? Is it the Spirit? The Son? The Father? Which box can we put the flame or the angel of the Lord in? And how about Genesis chapters 18 and 19, where Adonai appeared to Abraham, astonishingly, 
as three men. Was God only one of the men? Was he all three? The text is unclear. Then it says that two of the men who went down to Sodom were actually angels, and that Adonai remained with Abraham. So which person of the Trinity appeared to Abraham? Was it the son? Was it the father? The scriptures just say Adonai. And what do you do with those angels? At first, they were men whom Abraham saw when Adonai appeared to him. Were those two men also Adonai and then later became angels? Were they actually angels the whole time? How do these angels relate to the angel of the Lord? Who knows? And then there's what they call a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. Maybe that's what one of the men was. But then how could the Son of God appear as a man before he became flesh? I'll actually be talking about this in the next episode. So the whole passage here is very confusing all by itself, just taking it at face value. Trying to make it more orderly or understandable or spiritual by passing it through a Trinitarian filter just further obscures God's word. So what these examples show us is that God can and has appeared to humankind and interacted with our earthly surroundings, having manifested in ways that don't fit easily or at all into a Trinitarian framework. But when we're beholden to a doctrine like this, we're forced to do one of two things. Either temporarily suspend the doctrine and not apply it because it doesn't fit the passage we're dealing with, which would be cherry picking, or remain true to the doctrine and force a solution through false logic and imagination. We end up superimposing our doctrinal presuppositions onto the text, and then from that, extracting a supposition that leads us to drosh or teach on or understand the passage in a way that flings us away from God's word and into the wide open fields of our own intellectual and spiritual invention. So the doctrine of the Trinity creates a false and artificial trichotomy where we're forced to limit, categorize, and label every manifestation of God as either the Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. And this leads us to the second major problem created by Trinitarian doctrine, and probably the most egregious, which is that it needlessly strains, almost to the point of breaking, the plain teaching of Scripture that God is one. From a Jewish perspective, which the historical Christian church was all too eager to distance themselves from, the oneness of God is what sets apart the God of Israel from all other gods. As compared to the Trinity in Christianity, the belief that God is one is the singular foundational declaration, doctrine, and creed of biblical Jewish faith. And that's why we shouldn't be at all surprised that the Messiah of Israel himself, the Jewish Yeshua, made this very same seminal declaration. In Mark chapter 12, verse 29, when Yeshua was asked, which command of the Torah was above all others? He replied by reciting the Shema, as it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, Adonai is our God, Adonai is one. The Master Yeshua affirms, proclaims, and champions the oneness and indivisibility of the God of Israel. To call that belief into question is to undermine not only the scriptures, but Yeshua himself. The doctrine of the Trinity, then, which declares that God is exactly three in one, is not only a challenge to the clear teaching of scripture, but an affront to the core of Jewish belief. It erects an unnecessary barrier to Jewish people coming to Yeshua because it makes an instant and indelible distinction between Christian belief and the fundamentally Jewish messianic faith of the scriptures. The moment that the man-made Trinity doctrine is able to conjure up in our minds a tripartitioned God, or a three-headed God, or worse, three distinct gods, then the pure monotheism taught by the scriptures is placed in jeopardy. 
Because no matter how much mental gymnastics and creative explanations we employ in an attempt to hold God's oneness in our minds alongside the Trinity, the practical outworking of people's understanding of God in three persons shatters that singularity. Take Yeshua, for example. Scripture repeatedly teaches us that he's the Son of God. But in Trinitarian terms, he's the second person of the Godhead. He's not the Father. He's not the Holy Spirit. He's the Son, the second person of the Trinity. So are we to believe, then, that only, quote-unquote, God the Son indwells the man, Yeshua? That just the Son, or the Word, indwelling Yeshua is what makes him God in the flesh? Where's that concept in the Bible? Because not only do the scriptures not even give a hint of this kind of thinking, unless you're reading it through a Trinitarian lens, but it's in direct conflict with Colossians 2, which says that all the fullness of the deity dwells bodily in him. All the fullness. So somehow, some way, beyond explanation and comprehension, the man Yeshua who is the Son of God, is also fully God in the flesh, not just one-third of God. The Bible simply doesn't elaborate on how this can be true. So to attempt to qualify or codify or categorize it is to limit God and to exceed His Word. So does all this put Adonai's oneness in conflict with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all being God? Not at all, because the reality of God being one, echad, while not implying more than one, can nevertheless accommodate a oneness that is at the same time compound and complex. We see this, for example, in the unity of two people in marriage, a man and a woman, who Genesis 2.24 says become basar echad, one flesh. We see this in Exodus 24.3 in the people of Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai, who committed themselves to the Torah with kol echad, one voice. And we see this in Nehemiah 7.66 in the returning exiles of Israel, who together as one assembly, kahal kechad, numbered more than 42,000. That Adonai is one should be beyond dispute. And the integrity of his oneness must not divide into any fixed number, much less three. Yet the extent of God's oneness can still contain the mystery of his greatness. And though we cannot truly fathom its height or breadth or depth, we can still accept its endless capacity for infinite expression. The doctrine of the Trinity falls short because rather than embracing the messy and inexact explanation of God provided by Scripture. It attempts to explain and categorize the nature of God by way of man's reason. While it is indeed necessary for a biblical faith to believe that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are each and together God, that these three share a commonality and unity in deity, Trinitarian doctrine exceeds this scriptural teaching by asserting that the totality of God is that of a triune Godhead consisting of and limited to three persons. What this attempt to define God ironically does then, rather than bring biblical understanding, is create substantial obstacles to both biblical understanding and a biblical perception of the nature of God. It artificially forces every recorded manifestation of God into the category of either Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. It needlessly strains the plain, fundamental teaching of Scripture that God is one, and therefore unnecessarily erects a significant barrier to the acceptance of Yeshua by his own Jewish people by undermining the foundational creed of scriptural Jewish faith. The bottom line is that nothing in Scripture puts or locks God into a triune Godhead. On the contrary, not only is the exact relationship between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit scripturally unclear, but Scripture depicts God 
interacting with his creation in a multitude of ways that simply don't fit naturally into a Trinitarian framework. Scripture's testimony of who God is, specifically in light of who Yeshua is as God in the flesh, is controversial enough on its own. What we don't need is to compound the problem by perpetuating ancient, invented concepts and terminology that don't exist in the Bible. And while many will find Scripture's explanation of God intellectually unsatisfying, it's simply better to just let Scripture say what it does say and not say what it doesn't, without trying to make God's Word and God Himself fit our conclusions. Psalm 104, verse 1, and 145, verse 3, explain God this way. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. I don't accept the man-made doctrine of the Trinity, because it both exceeds and limits what the Bible teaches us about God. Instead, I believe what the scriptures say, that God is one, he is the Father, we can walk by the Spirit, and be saved by the Son. Thanks for joining me for the Biblically Correct Podcast. If you like this episode, please support us by making a donation. Of course, don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and ring the bell to receive notifications of new episodes. Until next time, remember that every scripture is God-breathed. Shalom.